This episode is brought to you by Bad Boy Boards. Based right here in Denver, Bad Boy Boards takes raw hardwood and turns it into world-class cutting boards, charcuterie boards, chess boards, and more. It's a local brand with high quality and great prices, which is great because home chefs like me don't have to settle for anything less than simple elegance in world-class quality hardwood boards and dust covers. Learn more and order your own individually designed, constructed, and finished board at badboyboards.com. Today on CityCast Denver. We only have three weeks left to pick our next mayor. Ballots are going out this week, so it's time to get serious, Denver. Will it be Johnston or Bruff? It's Tuesday, so my producer Paul Caroli and I are looking into the state of the mayor's race, car-free weekends downtown this summer, and all the other local stories that matter. Today is Tuesday, May 16th. I'm Bree Davies, and here's what Denver's talking about. Good morning, Bree. Good morning. I'm back. <laughs> From the depths of preschool virus hell. Uh, Welcome back. How are you feeling? <laughs> I'm feeling good. My son my son went to school for the first time and came home with a cold that knocked us both out. So <laughs> I've heard that's how it goes. It is. I, I heard from my doctor that children get sick an average of 39 times a year. So we're oh. going to start with what we love to talk about here in Colorado, which is the weather. What is going on, Paul? I mean, it's the biggest story of the week, for sure. True. We've had rain for like, what, five days straight? So wild. It's been crazy. I was not prepared. My garden looks so good right now. Mm. It has been so rewarding already. I mean, this is the time of year and the weather is just perfect. I'm so psyched about it. You do? Are you a rain guy? You like rain? Yeah. I mean, it's nice when it happens. It's soothing when it happens. We get plenty. Yeah. I have to say, I I wasn't super prepared. However, this year, mm-hmm. I bought waterproof Uggs because they were hip. All of a sudden, Uggs were back for some reason. You know, I've just been wearing them for the last 10 years, not being cool. But these clear ones... Like where you could see the inside, the fur on the inside. And I actually got to use them for like an actual purpose. What? <laughs> well, because they're like pla- they're like clear coat. So usually they're like suede. The cool ones that were in this year were plastic and you could see the inside. That's the cool part. But they were functional for the first time in rain. So there you go. I felt excited to wear them for an actual purpose. <laughs> but the question is really... Have we seen the last snow? That's always the question this time of year. Yeah, I mean, it's Mother's Day. So the conventional wisdom is that there will be no more snow. So it's okay for for the gardeners like me out there to put their plants in the ground because they won't get frozen. I dug into this a little bit. I found an article from our friend, Rain or Shine. It's our weather guy, Andy Stein. Andy Stein! Uh, He actually took this question on a couple of years ago and got the data. And according to Andy, he says that the average date of the last one inch of snow here in Denver is April 22nd, which we are a few weeks past. Now, however, the latest date of the last one inch of snow on record is May 29th. That's from 1975, May 29th. Holy cow. So there is a chance, it seems, that we could get another snowfall before, uh, before summer really properly starts. I would not be surprised about that whatsoever. You think you're feeling it? You think we got one more snow in us? We got five days of rain. How wild is that? It wouldn't be that wild to get a snow in May. I feel like if you've been in Colorado for a while, you always have, you always have a story. It's like, oh, we were supposed to have a graduation outdoors, but it snowed. Or we were supposed to mm-hmm. have a wedding outside, but it snowed in May. Do you want to take any bets? Do you have like a day? No, I think it's past. I think it's past. <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling it. I think I've got full summer vibes. I think we're done with snow this year. I think we're going to get snow and I think it's going to be on the day. The Casa Bonita opens. <laughs> Being in the know, as people we are, we have been given four different dates for opening, right? Rumored dates. We got the 5th. Someone said the 22nd. Someone said the 26th. The last one we heard was the 31st. 
We have heard actually nothing, though. These are real, really just rumors. In, in case in case someone is listening for the first time and doesn't know what Casa Bonita is, it's <laughs> it's a Mexican restaurant on West Colfax. <laughs> but the, the story is that the guys who made South Park, Matt Stone and Trey Parker, bought it last year and have been working on reopening it. And they said that it's going to happen in May. But here we are, guys. We're halfway through May. There's no date. We have heard nothing. It's very hard to plan around this. We're just putting it out there, but we'd really like to plan something special because we love this place so much. I do want to correct you, Paul. It is not just a Mexican restaurant on West Colfax. (laughs) It's a Mexican (laughs) village in a strip mall with a waterfall indoors. I will say, though, last week, in their typical cryptic ways, we got an email from Casa Bonita that just sent us a bunch of gifts of people working on the interior, like the deep cleaning that they're doing, the the installing of the fixtures. And we'll put a link to it in our show notes. But it looks, you guys, it does look exactly the same. I know we've talked about this, but it's weird. Isn't it weird to you? Yeah, it is a little weird. I I think the weird part, well, there's a couple of weird parts with these gifts. Um, One is there's a guy giving a fresh coat of paint to a tree, which is just a funny (laughs) image. I mean, in any context, that's just silly. But the other thing is it, it looks higher contrast to me. Like in my memory, Casa Bonita from a few years ago was just a little bit more faded. And maybe that's just because like I knew about how the business was going and how it was maybe not doing so well. And it, it just has taken on a bit of a sepia tone in my mind, but these gifs, they pop, they're cleaning off the plaques for the, the whole record of employees of the month going back years and years and years. And they're glistening. I I still want to maintain some critical distance, but it does look very cool. It looks like you'll be able to have a good time there. Like you remember, but clean. I think if anything, we just get a clean version of our favorite place which rules. Is there any part of it where like being too clean would be not a good thing? You know, I thought about this and I think after the experience we've had with COVID, do you remember the, do you remember the time of COVID when we were wiping our groceries down with like disinfectant wipes? Absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think after that experience, I feel really good about it not being disgustingly dirty. Like think about 40 years of uh, dirt, traffic, Mexican food and water on carpet. Like, just just think about that for a minute, Paul. Yeah, I mean, the carpet is definitely one where cleaning would be much appreciated. And I think we've talked about this before, but we've heard that they, like, went out of their way to match the carpet exactly as it was. So, again, you won't notice, but I think you're right, Paul. It'll look brighter. I don't think it was just your memory that sepia, the sepia tone that <laughs> experience of Casa Bonita was that layer of grime. Do you think they're going to have a tribute to the old Casa Bonita? How I imagine it is like one section that's like framed. It's like a picture frame around a section they didn't clean. (laughs) And it just like shows you this is what it used to be like. (laughs) That's a pretty good idea. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. So again, we're always looking for tips. You can call the Casa Bonita hotline at 720-500-5418. Give us your tips. Give us your theories. Give us whatever. Let us know what you're doing in preparation. We're still trying to figure out what we're going to do, but uh, we'll we'll keep on it. Oh, I got to tell you something about that later today, by the way. I got good news, but it's not for the show. We're just going to, it'll be, you know, a tease for the listeners, but I got some good news. We'll talk about it later. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Well, moving on. We're talking about the dream of a car-free city, which happened sort of over the weekend when Broadway and Welton were shut down to cars. The Viva Streets program, which is happening um, four Sundays through spring and summer, and they're closing three miles of streets to cars and opening them to pedestrians and cyclists. So the route is Broadway from Alameda to Welton and then Welton to Downing, which is a pretty big thoroughfare. It's a lot. Those are well-used streets by cars, for sure. I mean, it's sort of part of this larger project that the Denver Streets Partnership, our friends, Denver Streets Partnership, we've had Jill Locantore on, we've had Molly McKinley. We love those folks. But um, they partnered with the Downtown Denver Partnership in the city to make this happen. And I think the idea was to see what Denver could be like if we devoted more space to pedestrians and cyclists and removed the car element. 
this was on Sunday. I, you're a cyclist. Did you go and check this out? You know, to be honest, I was pretty uh, cynical about it. We, Patty uh, Calhoun brought it up on our, our Friday show, the editor of Westward. That's right. And she was talking about how Taste of Colorado was shifting to kind of adapt to be a part of this new event. And um, all I could think about was the traffic. And I was so cynical about it. But then on Sunday... I had an experience. I bet a lot of other people had the similar one. You know, you log onto social media, you start to see pictures of what this looks like. Yeah. All these people walking through the middle of Broadway or the middle of Welton. And it it was, uh, it kind of changed my mind a little bit about it. Like I kind of wanted to be down there except for, well, it was a little bit overcast this weekend. I think they probably would have had a better turnout if the weather was a bit better and maybe it will be. Uh, for the the Viva Streets in June and uh, and July and August, hopefully. But yeah, once I saw the pictures, I was like, "Ooh, that that kind of looks fun, biking up and down a big wide open street." Yeah. So, Paul, walk me through your cynicism a little bit about this initial idea of closing the streets down. First impression was that it kind of reminded me of the Free Fare for Better Air program that RTD la- did last year where they had free fares for the month of August. And it was promoted as this, you know, as this thing to improve our air quality. So if you follow the logic of that, the you can see that what they're hoping for is that people get out of their cars and get onto the bus. And we therefore produce less carbon emissions. Now, since then, RTD and its advocates have talked a lot about how ridership went up, but I still have yet to see data on whether or not car drivership went down during that month. So that's the frame I saw it in, this Viva Streets project. But I, I learned this weekend, after seeing these pictures, I did kind of a a little dive into the history of this program. It's totally different. It's the, the idea of this event, it's not really climate oriented at all. It's really much more about community. Like it, it derives from this uh, tradition that's been happening in Bogota, Colombia since 1974. And their whole downtown basically shuts down every Sunday in Bogota. There's a 70 mile route through the city. It attracts more than 1 million people to bike and walk through Bogota. And there's no cars. That's amazing. Yeah. So like every week, this is just part of their city. You know, you get out in the park, you go outside, you go for a walk through the, the streets. You just, you meet people. Feels like very community oriented and and really wonderful and exactly the kind of thing that I would want for our city. But I'm still seeing two pictures here being painted, which is, I, I think the data probably shows they pull many cars off the street if they do this every Sunday, right? The emissions, that that has to have an impact for sure. But like, is it changing people's behavior outside of that day? Yeah, that's the thing that I keep coming back to too, is it's about habit. Like if we're the, th- the reason why I think it seems to be working in Bogota is they do it every week, every Sunday and every national holiday. You just know to expect that with RTD and these pilot programs, they'll just sort of try something and then you get some data, but th- you can always ask questions about it. And I don't know. They never really seem to go full, full bore into something like this. Yeah, I'd be curious. I mean, I think it's incredible that it's happened at all. I don't want to undermine the fact that folks worked really hard to make this happen in the first place. And the idea is to introduce folks to the street in a new way, I think, right? You're a cyclist. I've been a cyclist off and on. And I know the biggest impact on me becoming one or doing that or changing that habit for a while, at least, was having the practice, like being able to try it. Hopefully... It it does change some folks' mind around driving, but um, I would be curious what the what the end data and end game data was. Uh, for Viva Streets, for me, the question is about business owners and do they actually benefit? Because mm. this is not an RTD program, Viva Streets. I don't think RTD is involved. Point. The main driver is the Downtown Denver Partnership, and they're trying to promote business downtown. And in Bogota, I read that the 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 chief complaints about this every Sunday shutting down the streets thing that they do is from business owners who say that people struggle to access their businesses the way that they think that they might not if the streets, you know, if there were cars. So I I would be eager to hear from business owners about, you know, on South Broadway, um, on Welton, did, did this lead to a boost and, uh, and would you like to see more of it? Thanks, Paul. I think we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with something else.
Hey Denver, are you ready to explore? The North Face is officially open, right in their headquarters backyard at Park Meadows. Everything you need for your next journey is now all in one spot. From men's and women's outdoor apparel to backpacks, technical accessories, and so much more. This gear is engineered to perform at the limits of human potential, and it's available in a variety of fresh colors and styles for the season ahead. Every piece they create is designed to get you out there, way, way out there. So no matter how you choose to immerse yourself in the outdoors, whether it be through hiking, climbing, camping, skiing, snowboarding, or beyond, their gear is here to take you further. Find them on the second floor, find all the essentials you need, then go ahead, get out there, and start your journey. The exploration starts there. This episode is brought to you by Uller's Garden. Did you know you can buy fresh, locally grown greens from an organic farm right on South Broadway? Uller's Garden is a hydroponic container farm specializing in living lettuce. That's right, when you order from Uller's, their lettuce heads come with the roots intact, meaning your greens are picked fresh and will last longer. Uller's uses 95% less water than the average farm and is all organic. No pesticides or chemicals here, so you don't even have to worry about washing your greens. Sign up for their farm share program now and pick up a box of fresh lettuce, arugula, and basil every Tuesday, June through August. Think global, but act local and support your local environmentally friendly farm today. Visit ullersgarden.com for more information. That's U-L-L-R-S garden.com. So aside from Viva Streets, uh, RTD, speaking of other <laughs> other transit options, right. what's going on with RTD lately, Paul? We talked a little bit about the Free Fair August program last year. They are talking now about expanding that this year. Um, there was a board committee meeting I just caught a few minutes of from last week. Oh my gosh, that is so boring. Those RTD board <laughs> meetings, <laughs> they're all still on Zoom. Not much to say there, but they're talking about expanding that to July and August this year. And the final vote on that is going to be um, from the RTD full board at the end of this month. So we'll have an update for you about that later on. I will be curious. So, okay, I'll just say this. Every time we talk about transit on this show, we get a lot of response, right? Um, our listeners are very, very engaged in the transit conversation. And I thought something interesting showed up. Um, Corey Hutchins, who's a reporter here in Colorado, he, <laughs> speaking of speaking to ourselves, he writes a newsletter that covers the media in Colorado, like what we're doing. And he he shared this LinkedIn post from a marketing strategist here named Eric Anderson, who had shared on LinkedIn, he shared this Washington Post profile of a Denver bus driver that recently won a Pulitzer Prize. We talked about this story a couple of months ago when it came out, and it was this profile of an RTD driver and just kind of like the hell she goes through every day as a driver. Do you remember this story, Paul? Oh, heartbreaking. I, I haven't stopped thinking about this. And the reason that he shared it was his critique was... Um, the way that we report on transit in Denver, the way reporters talk about it. What Eric Anderson said in his post on LinkedIn was, it's disappointing that it took a national writer to describe this daily local reality on public transit where many are wary of the potential for chaos on the bus or light rail train. Unfortunately, some of our local transportation reporters are relentless boosters of RTD. And although they acknowledge the system's problems, they, their unapologetically, quote, solutions oriented coverage demonstrates a desperation for transit to work. And yes, there's some anti-car bias driving their coverage, too. What did you think about that critique, Paul? Actually, you know what? I want to send it back to you. I want to hear what you think first. I mean, I think I'm always examining how we talk about our city, that that bias line that uh, in recent years has come to light as something that reporters are grappling with. What is our bias? Where are our biases? And this is something that I had never thought about. Um, and I, I don't know if I agree with him, but it made me think, are we doing justice for our city and our readers and our listeners and for the constituents? Are we doing the kind of reporting that's actually helpful? And I don't know. I think I struggle with our transportation conversations in general because they tend to hyper focus on a small amount of voices and don't necessarily address the bigger reality of what it's like to get around in this city. What voices are you thinking of? I mean, 
we just talked about it. Denver Streets Partnership. Love them. I think they're amazing advocates, but they're our go-to every time we talk about transit, right? We know. We talk to them because they're experts. Mm -hmm. But what about the expert that is the person that is driving the car, that is riding the bus? And again, they represent those folks. But I just sometimes think we're kind of in our own bubble when we talk about an issue like transit, housing could be another conversation that's similar to this. But are we just talking to ourselves over and over again and not necessarily talking to the average person who's like, actually riding the bus sucks and I hate it? You know what I mean? I do know what you mean. I mean, I think it's a good point. Personally, I, I think that Eric Anderson here uh, is exactly right. I think that there is anti-car bias driving local transportation coverage here in Denver. But I think it's for a good reason. I mean, what you said about how with the way journalists think about bias changing in the last few years really resonates with me. Like there are certain things that are just treated as like value negative or value good. Like we don't talk about climate change as if it's a theory anymore. We, you talk about it as if it is a fact. It is our environment. It is the water we swim in as as the little fish that we are. So I think that's where it comes from, you know, covering Covering transportation issues, I think when you think about it every day, you can you can really easily see that bigger context of climate change and environmental catastrophe, like just imminent ahead of us if we don't make certain changes to the way that we use our resources on this planet. It's hard to defend because there are there is that silent majority that you you want to tell the stories of the people of the community you serve. Yes, and you don't want to feed into narratives that are sometimes created around singular events or that come to define a moment. And right. that was something else that Eric Anderson shared in his post was when my son took RTD home from school, he saw a lot of chaos and was identified as a potential witness in a criminal prosecution. That's not what a parent wants to hear ever. And I agree with him. I think about my son and eventually he's going to probably be writing RTD to get to school. And I don't want him to be a witness in a criminal prosecution either. So that's a story. That's a story. That's a experience. But we don't want that to define everybody's experience. But at the same time, are we undermining that experience by being boosters for better transit? I think the responsibility there is to make sure that that's not a surprise that that's the environment you're putting your kid into. Like that's the role of the journalist in that situation is not to like, you know, to say, Oh, look at all ugly and horrible and violent RTD is for this kid. Right. But it's to say, this is what it looks like. This is what the city looks like. Make your plan accordingly. For sure. Okay, Paul. So, you know, ballots, have ballots gone out? Ballots have gone out or they are going out. They are on their way to your mailbox. So we are, of course, talking about the runoff still. Paul, what are we talking about this? <laughs> this this episode, what are we talking about in regards to the runoff? We should say later this week, listeners will be able to hear interviews that you and I conducted with the two oh, yes. candidates, Mike Johnston and Kelly Bruff. But it's a little tease for that. I think what we can do is get into a little bit of the, the messaging and the state of the race here. Um, so before the first time we voted for mayor <laughs> six weeks ago, um, we, we did this episode where we looked at all the mayoral campaign TV ads. Or internet ads, or to it, be fair. Yeah, some of them some of them weren't on TV. I actually don't know. It's really hard to tell. I think most of them were not on TV, but yes. Huh. Um, <laughs> anyway. New one just dropped from the Bruff campaign. Her new ad, let's watch it together. I'm new to this whole candidate thing. I've never run for office before, but I have run the city. As Mayor Hickenlooper's chief of staff, I'm Kelly Bruff, and far-fetched empty promises won't solve our problems. I'll never promise something I can't deliver. It's why I'm endorsed by Denver police officers, two former police chiefs, Governor Ritter, Wellington and Wilma Webb, and so many others. They know that this time, the most qualified man for the job is a woman. That's me. What's the point that Kelly's making here? I absolutely agree. It sucks. We have been a city for this long and never had a woman leader. However, as a woman, I find it, um, I don't like it when I'm told that that is what should be my determining choice. Because hmm. it feels like you're being told that, oh, you're a woman. Don't you have a responsibility to break that glass ceiling? Yes. 
And like, or that, that a woman is going to represent everything that I'm looking for in leadership. Hmm. When in reality, women can be pulled every different way in politics, just like men can. Well, connected to that, um, I, I thought it was interesting. I wanted to ask you about this was we were prepping for those interviews I mentioned with Bruff and Johnston. I proposed that we ask them about abortion, abortion access. It's been a big issue across the state this year, ever since the Dobbs ruling last year. Why did you not want to ask these candidates about abortion, Bree? Because it doesn't happen at a municipal level. In Colorado, our governor is doing everything he possibly can to enshrine abortion in our constitution and make it a constitutional right, essentially, along with with legislators. A lot of them are women um, and along with abortion advocacy groups and uh, reproductive justice and reproductive health care groups that inform the legislation. This is a huge thing for Colorado, and it always has been, but he is hell-bent on making it accessible to anyone at any time, regardless of whether you live here or not. So it's not really a municipal issue. I mean, it'd be nice to hear that my mayor supports abortion access, but uh, we just don't deal with it on a municipal level. Anyway, so that was uh, the latest big slick TV ad in the race. I'm sure we'll see more from Mike Johnston soon because they're both still fundraising like crazy. Bree, where yeah. is the fundraising race at inside this mayor's race? Well, the thing that I really want to focus on is the super PAC side of it, because that's what's going to be funding a lot of advertisements in support of these candidates. But um, just to clarify, like super PACs have no contribution limit, but uh, the rule is they cannot coordinate with the candidates directly. And this was something that just caught my eye. Um, Denverite reported recently that the super PAC supporting Mike Johnston or in who's behind Mike Johnston mm -hmm. uh, poured more than half a million dollars into media ad buys. Wow. Half a million dollars, Paul. That's crazy. Oh, I'm just thinking about. Well, also, like, uh, this is a runoff. Can you what are we going to get? 20,000 votes? <laughs> like, what is I'm so curious what the dollars to vote ratio is going to be at the end of this. So these super PACs, is this what people mean when they say dark money? Because we don't know where it comes from exactly. And well, no, because you can look at who donates to a super PAC. Oh, OK, so it isn't dark money. It's just that you can donate to a super PAC. And basically the big things are there's an unlimited contribution limit. So you can you can donate unlimited amounts of money to that super PAC because it's not going directly to the candidate. I see. So you can push the candidate forward to the front that you think represents your organization or whatever you are. And that's the thing that I always look at. But um, the interesting thing is uh, media buy means a lot of TV advertising. The folks supporting Mike Johnson are putting a ton of money into TV. And we know why TV ads are effective because they reach the people that tend to come out and vote, which is older voters. So still surprising to me as a person that doesn't watch live TV. Hey, I think it matters. That's what the experts say, at least. Yeah, but I guess sure. we'll be watching that and see how this race develops over the next few weeks. Obviously, we'll be talking about it. I'm looking forward to talking again after uh, these interviews run so we can, you know, be a little bit more candid about those experiences. Um, and again, that's going to be later this week. We did learn a lot in those interviews. So I, I'm excited for us to share them with listeners. All right, Paul. Well, thanks for joining me. Absolutely. See you next time. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed the show, why don't you take a minute to tell Eric Anderson about us? Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter, Hey Denver, by texting Denver to 66866. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. See you later. Mm -hmm.